before starting this program, I'd like to announce that on April 14th, we will have a program on COVID and the U.S.-China relationship with Yuan Yuanang, Amy Selico, and Elizabeth Knuff speaking. Um, so we're, you know, that should also be an interesting program. Um, we're happy today to have with us Eli Ratner. You have his bio. Um, he is currently, so I won't go over the whole thing, which would take too long, but he is the executive vice president of a new American security, a center for a new, a new American security, um, where he's a member of the executive team and responsible for managing the center's research agenda and staff. You know, we all remember he was um, in the end of the Obama administration, he was deputy national security advisor to Vice President Joe Biden and was before that in the State Department, the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs. A couple of months ago, he and his colleagues at CNAS came out with a, um, a long paper called Rising to the China Challenge, Reviewing American Competitiveness in the Indo-Pacific. Um, what we'd like to do today is Eli will kick off um, just kind of talking about the paper, focusing on renewing American competitiveness. And then we'll, he and I will have a bit of a conversation and then we'll uh, take questions from the floor. We have a very large and illustrious group of people that are on this call. So we look forward to hearing from you and I'll get to as many questions as I possibly can. Eli's kind of become a regular for the committee after participating in our track two maritime dialogue on the South China Sea. He was a panelist on last year's uh, China Town Hall. Um, so Eli, it's great to have you here. Uh, talk for a few minutes and then I'll ask some questions and then we'll, we'll go on to uh, questions from the audience. Just one administrative point, which is if you want to submit a question, please click on the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. We will not use the raise your hand function during this program. Eli, let me turn it over to you and thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, well, thank you, Steve. And um, thank you everyone for taking time out of what I know is uh, everyone's busy schedule right now. And I'll just echo Steve, I hope everyone's uh, staying safe. Um, what Steve asked me to do is just talk for about 10 minutes or so, a little bit about the substance of this report that we released, um, as well as the process. What, what is this report actually, which, which might be of interest and set the context uh, for the work that we did. Um, so the origin of this report, uh, this was a congressionally mandated study. Um, the origin of it came out of the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, in the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the bill that the Senate Armed Services Committee writes every year for guidance for the Defense Department's priorities and spending. Um, and in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, as it's called a couple years ago, um, they put in a call for an independent study on U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and interestingly, even though it came out of the um, Armed Services Committee, which, which oversees the Pentagon, the reason that they did it is because they felt like the uh, Defense Department, the U.S. military were, was relatively focused uh, on the China issue, but that the rest of the government was not. Um, and so what they wanted to do was to call for what, what in Washington we call a whole, a whole of government strategy, but a a comprehensive strategy um, that would look at not only what the Defense Department needs to do, but what do the other agencies of the U.S. government need to do um, to successfully implement the free and open Indo-Pacific and the national defense strategy and some of the other strategies um, that the Trump administration had put forward. Um, they weren't looking for a new strategy toward China. They were looking for um, ideas really for policy recommendations associated with um, trying to get to through their conceptions of, of competition. Um, the Defense Department competed for the report, meaning they, they put out a public call. Any institution could submit uh, an application. CNAS did along with, uh, I believe, another, a number of 
think tanks, um, and we were awarded the study. And I think part of the reason for that, as we understood it, was um, one, that, that we're a bipartisan organization. Um, the people who worked on the report, uh, we have veterans of uh, George W. Bush administration, the Trump administration, as well as uh, the Obama administration. Um, and really, our organization is focused on, on concrete policy recommendations, not just the 30,000 foot uh, grand strategy debate. Um, and finally, we have a number of research programs um, that are quite collaborative, such that we could work in an integrated fashion, which is important for reasons that I'll talk about um, when I talk about the substance. Um, so we had about almost 20 researchers working on this report starting uh, around last April for a period of about eight months. We delivered the report to the Defense Department in December. They did an internal security review just to make sure, not, not to have us change our, any of our opinions, but for, to ensure we weren't including anything in there that was sensitive from a classified perspective or otherwise. They, they hardly changed a word, and then we released the public version that we put out uh, with the exception of just a couple words is exactly what we submitted privately to the government. So that's the background. Um, in terms of what's in the report, maybe I'll just say a few things. Um, the first is uh, you hear a lot that people talk about the China competition, but we don't really, no one ever articulates what the competition is actually over. What are we competing over? What's the desired end state? Um, we answered that question pretty, pretty directly. I agree with the critique that the Trump administration has not articulated that, that there are different people inside the administration that are probably aspiring toward different things. Um, but what we described is a, a contest over the future of the regional order in Asia and the international order more broadly. Um, and there is a, a, a preferred vision of a, that I think um, most policymakers in Washington would agree with that uh, would um, hope for a more open, more liberal international order as it relates to the security environment, the economic order, or the political order. Um, and there's an alternative order that uh, China is aspiring toward. Um, and that's not because the Chinese leadership has a secret strategy locked in a vault somewhere, it's, but rather because um, the exigencies of its system, of its national interests, of the Communist Party, um, drive it toward a set of foreign policy preferences that would be a different set than the, um, the U.S. desired order. It would likely be more closed economically, more state-led, less democratic politically, less open in terms of the information environment. Um, the security environment would be quite different than what the United States would look. And so what we posit is what the competition owes over, that, that neither of these orders are likely to um, appear in their pure form, we're going to get some mix of the two. And the competition is over, does the future order look more like the order that the uh, United States would prefer or more like the order that, that China would prefer? So that in view, our view, it's a contest over, over the international order, the rules, norms, and institutions that are going to be guiding international politics. So that's what the competition is about. Um, in terms of uh, the content of the study, you know, I'll, I'll just do this without getting into the policy recommendations, Steve. I'll just say, um, in the beginning of the study, we articulate what we describe as um, six core principles in the report. Uh, and those are um, ideas that came through as we had several different teams working on several different aspects of the report. We really looked at what the kinds of insights they were having, ideas they were coming up with, and um, tried to see what were those that, that spanned across the totality of the, the issue set. Um, and the, the, the ones that we came up with, so there were sixfold. Um, the first is that um, the China challenge, as we describe it, is a, a relatively urgent problem that, that demands uh, to be one of the, if not the, organizing principles of U.S. foreign policy, that the, there was a description in the national defense strategy that got a lot of news in national security circles that, as Secretary Mattis, who was Secretary of Defense at the time, described, that there was a, that there was a narrowing strategic advantage for the United States uh, in terms of its uh, military advantage in the Western Pacific vis-a-vis -vis China. 
But what we, what we saw is that as we were looking at the other domains, economics, technology, diplomacy, information, ideology, across all these other aspects of that competition that we saw a similar story of a narrowing strategic advantage for the United States. Uh, and, and that some of that, of course, yes, is the result of a natural redistribution of power in the United States. China's rising. Of course, it's going to have more influence. Um, but a lot of that we, we thought was due to decisions uh, that were being made in Washington uh, to allow that strategic advantage to narrow in a way that was not conducive with U.S. interests. So thinking about um, this as an urgent challenge, um, a challenge that's here and now. I mean, people often, it's, it's certainly changing in the last couple of years, but people have often talked about China as sort of the, far, the over the horizon challenge that we would have to think about someday, um, but not, not the challenge for now. I think what we were describing was, um, this is really a challenge for now, sort of an urgency to the problem. Um, the second underlying principle was that it's a, it's a comprehensive competition. Um, and that's really important because you do hear people say, well, it's, it's all about technology or it's all about the military. And, and I think what, what we uh, determined was that, um, you know, it's not all about one thing. It's about a number of key, what we call vectors of the competition. And we looked at um, defense, uh, we looked at seven different areas, defense, technology, economics, diplomacy, uh, information and ideology, governance and human rights, uh, and talent, um, the competition over, over human capital. Um, and that the United States needs to be, this doesn't mean the United States needs to be competing everywhere over all things, but it does mean that particularly in the way that these areas of the competition interact, that we need to be thinking about how we're competing in those different uh, domains, some of which are very familiar to policy makers in Washington, some of which are not. Um, so thinking about it in a comprehensive way, uh, and then you know this gets into bureaucratic politics that that maybe not everyone's interested in, but thinking about policy making in a more integrated way too, because clearly um, the U.S. government is not designed to deal with a lot of these issues that are at the seams of economics and technology and national security. Um, our bureaucracy is not set up for that. So we need to think about how to be more integrated. Um, the third point, the third core principle was um, really that we need to put a strong emphasis on U.S. competitiveness. That fundamentally, fundamentally, the China challenge is about the United States rising to the China challenge is about the United States. And we have the subtitle of the report about renewing American competitiveness. Um, that was all um, very deliberate. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that, um, you know, I won't speak for all my co-authors, but it's certainly my belief that one of the mistakes of China's strategy in the past is that it was often designed around trying to change China um, and very focused on um, that as the object of whether we were succeeding or not. Were we changing China in the way that we wanted to? Um, and I think it's important at this point to um, accept the, the China that is and think about, um, you know, designing a strategy for the China that we have today. If China changes, if Xi Jinping changes his orientation, great. Um, but let's put together a, a, a strategy for the China that we're facing, not the one that we aspire toward. Um, in addition to that, um, as it relates to this notion of American competitiveness, um, fundamentally important um, for the United States to be putting forward um, alternatives to China or to China's uh, vision of the future. You know, I think the Trump administration has overemphasized um, trying to slow China down and underemphasized trying to speed America up. Um, so we have, you know, on an issue like Huawei, we have a lot of energy and calories being spent on trying to prevent countries from uh, using Huawei, but not a lot on developing an American alternative. So we're not going to we're not going to uh, succeed in this competition without putting forward alternatives on a whole number of issues. And that, again, uh, means that we need to be thinking about ourselves. And, and the final thing I'll say just about this competitiveness issue um, is that it really does, I think, uh, have more bipartisan purchase and is, is a more inclusive 
concept than um, what the Trump administration has put forward. And Steve, we can talk a little bit more about the politics of some of this if, if you'd like. Um, just three more quick points in terms of the underlying um, principles. Um, the fourth is just the fundamental importance of allies and partners. Um, and, you know, that word gets thrown around a lot in Washington, um, not always with great clarity. Um, but it is the case that, again, across almost every one of these vectors of the competition, um, there's hardly an area where the United States is going to succeed working completely on its own. Um, given the nature of the global economy, given Chinese advantages of scale, given Chinese advantages of geography uh, in Asia, um, there really aren't a lot of unilateral solutions here. So this doesn't mean we need a you know, anti-China coalition or an Asian NATO. I think everyone knows that's not gonna happen. Um, but what, what it does mean is the United States needs to be thinking about what are the various coalitions of countries, some that may include China, that it's building um, to enhance its competitiveness on a number of these issues. So the allies and partners piece is really important. Um, and maybe if, if folks wanna talk a little bit about, more about that, there's a little bit more to say about the allies question, which I think is interesting. Um, two more points quickly, uh, so I'm not going on too long here. Um, the fifth, um, which I think for me anyway, was probably the most uh, interesting intellectually, um, is the argument that um, the United States really needs to be in the business here of building international order, um, being order building. Um, and that far too often, I think we've fallen into um, the trap of being very defensive about the post-Cold War international order in a way where we perceive ourselves as in a defensive crouch trying to protect an old system and China's the rising power trying to revise it. Um, I just don't think that's the right framework. And I think the better framework is that the United States and China are both competing to build a new international order. Um, one, because um, you know that old system, that old post-Cold War system didn't really turn out the way we hoped in terms of integrating China and changing China as I described earlier, but also because there are a number of issues that that old system doesn't really address. Domains like space and cyber, certain investment arenas, et cetera. So the United States would be in a much better strategic mind frame, I think, to be thinking about building order. What are the new institutions that we need to be building? Thinking about um, innovation and entrepreneurship as at the core of U.S. foreign policy rather than how do we protect and defend uh, or repair an old system? Though, of course, some of those institutions are important, but um, thinking much more about building. Um, and then the final point is very simple, which is just that um, this is not gonna be easy. Uh, and in some ways, um, you know, the old theory of China strategy in the post-Cold War period was that um, we were gonna pursue our liberal international order, and that was gonna, for all intents and purposes, prevent a China challenge from ever rising in the first place. Um, that, you know, it was gonna, both by inducement and um, pressure, was gonna uh, lead China to accept our system. I think given the fact that that hasn't happened, um, this is gonna require us to make compromises, endure costs that maybe we weren't expecting or hoping for, um, and that's gonna require, um, leveling with the American people about that, educating the American people about what we're doing and why, and, and make, getting the buy-in of the American people, and um, uh, as well as our political leadership. So, um, Steve, that's a lot to put on the table, um, but happy to get into uh, some of the specifics as well. I think that that was a terrific introduction, Re really great. Um, one of the great things, I think, about the report, which I can say, is that even if you disagree with some with the way China is characterized, you have to agree with an overwhelming majority of the recommendations of restoring American competitiveness. That if China has to serve as the uh, reason why we restore American competitiveness, that's great, but so many of the things um, that you talk about in the report are just things I kind of read and I go, yeah, more people who, who, who go to Asia, bigger, 
more people understand Asia, more people who speak Asian languages, more diplomatic commercial representation throughout Asia, um, going on and on. I think those are, it makes the report, in my view, very, very valuable. Um, you submitted in December and you, the, they, it got published, I think, on January 28th. Given what's happened in the last two months, obviously, um, you know, we've seen the consequences of the strategic rivalry between the United States and China, reducing cooperation between the two great powers in the healthcare area compared to what happened on SARS, on Ebola, swine flu, H1N1. We're not really cooperating well. We removed our CDC representative from China in, uh, in July of last year. Would you have written this slightly differently if you were completing it today? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think the, um, maybe I'll just say one thing about your, let, let me just, before I answer that, maybe just respond to your initial comment, because I think it's really important. Um, and, and folks, maybe uh, particularly those who are, who are not in Washington, sort of following the day-to-day -day policy debate, um, might be interested in some reflections on this, which is, um, you know, the fact that I think Steve's right, Steve, you're right, that a number of people from across the political spectrum who debate bitterly about some of these fundamental questions about China and U.S.-China policy and, you know, how illiberal are they, how revisionist are they, um, how confrontational should the United States be in its strategy, what are the prospects for cooperation, all the big questions. Um, underneath those fierce um, ideological battle are, is a huge amount of agreement on what policy agenda should be. I mean, there are people who, I think if, if we put a strategy together uh, with a group of people, Eli, we can see you again. Okay, <laughs> good, I'm sorry about that. And apologize for my baseball background here. I'm on my phone now, so I think uh, the connection should be more stable and I apologize. Great. And, and I apologize to everyone watching. I hope you're hanging in there. Um, I know this stuff is, is frustrating. Um, so I'll make this point one more time. I don't know if, if, if the internet's not liking it, but the, uh, the point was simply what you said, Steve, which is I think if you take people from uh, very different reaches of the, of the ideological spectrum or the spectrum about China, um, there would be a wide swath of agreement on a number of areas of U.S. policy where we need to uh, really pull our socks up and, and make America stronger. Um, and I think that is, you know, people talk about um, the new consensus on China, and, and I don't think there's a new consensus on China on sort of the Trump administration's version of strategic competition, for better or for worse. Um, that's not the new consensus. I think the new consensus is that the old policy uh, didn't get us where we wanted to go. Um, and I think there is a new consensus around the ways in which the United States ought to be more competitive in Asia and, and the things it needs to do to help uh, in areas of where it's competing with China. Um, and I think we ought to move out on those. And, and I think we spend too much time as a community on those big uh, 30,000 foot um, theoretical debates when in fact we we agree a lot on the on the lower level areas where where we can move forward sure agree two months later would it look different yeah so I think you know so we may it would have been interesting to look more obviously at the area of public health I mean I am the the uh, director of studies at a think tank uh, so of course I'm thinking about <laughs> Uh, you know, what does this issue mean for international politics? How is it affect, affecting the kind of issues that we think about? Um, I think in general, you know, the, uh, many of the issues that we were talking about are, are looking at in this report are um, longer term areas of competition uh, that are not going away despite the COVID crisis. And I think in many ways, um, this crisis is going to accelerate a lot of the trends we are already seeing. I think it's accelerating the tensions in the relationship. Um, I think it's accelerating some of the economic trends and, and technological trends associated with supply chains and, and decoupling um, and otherwise. So um, does it highlight, does this crisis highlight 
the fact that in certain instances, it would be great to have greater cooperation between um, the United States and China. I think that's probably the case in public health, but it's also the case that, um, you know, at least from my perspective, some of the actions that Beijing took early on in the crisis in terms of, um, you know, quelling dissent, uh, not being transparent uh, about what was going on on the ground, um, not being open to international institutions, et cetera, highlight really some of the differences between uh, their priorities and their prioritization of domestic security and their political security over some of these other issues that are at the root of the problem. So I don't think it's simply a case of, doesn't this demonstrate that um, we all would have been better off with cooperation? That being said, of course, where we are now, um, whether it's in the G20 context or bilaterally, um, it, it's important that our doctors are talking to each other um, that our finance ministries are talking to each other, et cetera, to, to coordinate action. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, my view has been that there's a real consequence to this, to characterizing it as strategic competition, that, you know, a lot of Chinese policy is reactive, whether we like it or not. You cannot excuse the early days of what China did in terms of, um, not allowing information to come out when trans transparency is part of the cure, as we know. There's no question, but by they didn't, they took WHO people, they cooperated with WHO, but they didn't cooperate really with the United States, with the CDC the way they did before. And that was, was um, very distressing and may have ultimately cost American lives. Um, what's the risk, Eli, of this being a self fulfilling prophecy? that as we keep taking a harder and harder line on China and characterizing, I notice you use, by the way, strategic rival, but you do a strategic competitor, but you don't use revisionist power the way the national security strategy um, did. I don't, I don't know if that was deliberate, but what are the, what's the risk that this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, that's a, I mean, that's a, common argument and and people have been making that argument you know you go back to the 1990s and there's a lot of people saying you know we cannot make this a self-fulfilling prophecy we can't have a overly competitive approach toward china um i think there's a there's a few ways i would respond to that i mean first off um my view anyway is that china has been competing against the united states and viewing the united states as a rival for decades now um, that it's not as if uh, thinking competitively, trying to catch up with the United States, thinking, seeing the United States as a strategic rival, particularly in Asia, is something new to Beijing. So in some ways, in my view, this is the United States starting to align its or orientation a little to more similarly to the way China has been thinking about the problem set. Um, moreover, and I think more importantly, strategically, I mean, this is, this is really uh, at the root of the, uh, of the debate here, I think, which is that in my view anyway, um, the problem insofar as there's instability in the US-China relationship, potential instability in Asia, um, that, that that instability is stemming from a lack of competitiveness by the United States. Um, the problem is, that the United, is not that the United States has been so competitive that it's tripping the relationship toward confrontation. I think it's been the opposite, that the United States has created openings that has led to a certain type of Chinese behavior or assertiveness, and that the way to stabilize the relationship, stabilize the region, um, would be through a more confident, more engaged, stronger United States. So to me, um, enhancing competitiveness is the road back to stability, not the path to instability. Though, of course, a purely confrontational approach uh, is likely to be quite destabilizing, but I don't think that's what, uh, you know, that's not what we're proposing here in the report. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, you've got agreement from me on that too. Um, the report says the military balance is tipping against us. We're spending, what, four and a half times what the Chinese are spending? Well, what's going on here? Yeah, so this is a, uh, common question, you know, how can we be uh, at risk of our losing our, our military advantage when uh, our defense budget is so large, it's larger than the next 10 
uh, countries combined? Um, the answer to that is the United States have a, has a global military footprint. Um, and so we have operations all around the world. Um, we're involved in um, conflict in a, in a few different places that's quite costly. We have very expensive systems, expensive personnel. Um, China's taking on some of those costs now, but they're fighting a much more localized uh, game. Uh, and so for them to, uh, to compete in a defensive posture in the Western Pacific uh, is a much less expensive proposition than the United States main maintaining a, a global military presence. So you really have to think about the geographical factors there. And they're basically defending closer to home. Exactly. Yeah, which is easier to do and less costly. Um, the report talks, and, and, and it, it talks about Americans will have to sacrifice and make trade-offs. What Americans will have to sacrifice and make trade-offs? Who, who are you referring to when you say that? And what Americans will win from this strategic, you know, it, it's, it's not even, it's not evenly distributed throughout America. Who wins from this and who, who, who loses? So it's a good question. I mean, I think the, um, again, I think a, uh, in, the, in the starkest sense, um, a more competitive United States will lead to a more secure and prosperous United States. Uh, and so a world in which we're losing our uh, military advantage, we're losing our technological advantage, we're becoming less relevant in setting economic and investment uh, uh, trade rules, um, a world in which that is getting less, less free and less democratic, that all of those things combined um, will not to be, will, will be to the disadvantage of most Americans. I mean, for you take an example, I mean, not to mention the security issues, but the technological issues. If the United States were to lose its position as a technological leader in the world, that would cascade down in, in any number of ways. So, um, you know, I think there are, hard choices here in terms of some of the spending that we're going to have to make in terms of setting priorities. Um, but I don't know what the, what the inference of the question is, that there's a perception that there's a, there are sort of particular special interests driving a more competitive U.S. agenda against China. I'm not sure. I'm not well, sure it, that's it's the case. More, it more relates to the defense spending. You know, it's, it's, um, no, I think that the competitiveness is, is, you know, you'll get no argument from me that that yeah. is absolutely central to what we should be doing in Asia. Um, when we're spending what we're spending on defense these days, and the report calls for increased expenditures, there are winners from those increased expenditures. Whereas, you know, I always go back to my favorite General Eisenhower quote, you know, for every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those that hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. So I would argue that some of these expenditures will have to take money from our social programs, which tend to support some in America, and our defense industries will do, and defense services industries do quite well. Well, we're not calling for increased defense expenditure in the report. Uh, and in fact, the uh, root of the, of the problem uh, as it relates to maintaining deterrence in Asia is not that we aren't spending enough money, it's that we need to develop new, you know, that we need to develop new operational concepts uh, to deal with the changing uh, challenge from China and its own military modernization. And in fact, um, a lot of the changes that uh, the folks at, at, in our defense team are, are looking at uh, are quite disruptive. Um, these are not, um, you know, the kinds of things that that are supporting legacy systems. It's much more about building a new type, a new American way of war, a new type of military, um, and it, it absolutely not needn't require uh, spending more money. So that's not really at the at the root of this. Mm -hmm. Good. You you want to end a lot of semiconductor exports to China. The report suggests. Some in the Pentagon believe that ending U.S. companies' ability to export to China will reduce revenue and profitability, and thereby, as a result of that, reduce what they spend in R&D. And that, in fact, 
reduces doesn't increase American competitiveness? Well, potentially, if it does, if it isn't made up for elsewhere. I mean, I think this is a this is an area where, um, and the the the, rec the specific recommendation that you're re referring to was around um, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, um, not the not the semiconductors themselves. Um, I think that was identified as a really important area of uh, U.S. technological advantage. That if again, if the United States were uh, were to lose over time would have very substantial economic and, and security effects on the United States. So, um, you know, this is an area where uh, short-term profits don't always align with long-term incentives. Um, I think that's an important uh, issue that runs throughout a lot of this. And I think there would have to be uh, consideration for what kind of government support could be provided to make up for, for that gap if the United States were to take a measure like that. Um, and it would, have to do it, it would have to do it unilaterally, which is something that we note uh, as well, because when the United States takes some of these protectionist trade remedy measures uh, unilaterally, um, it absolutely doesn't work because China can go to the next, the next bidder. So that's the kind of policy that would have to be coordinated with the small number of other countries that are in that business. But I take your I take your point. I think we addressed that um, head on in the report in the language underneath that recommendation and do note that there's a trade off there as it relates to some of the revenue that would go to research and development and that would have to be um, made up for elsewhere. Yep. The um, one last question then I go, we now have uh, more than a dozen questions, which I will now get to, but just talk about Huawei in your, in your, um, in the report, you've called for further, restrictions on Huawei in the 5G area. Um, in September of last year, uh, Tom Friedman met with the CEO of Huawei and he offered to license the entire Huawei 5G platform to any American company that wants to manufacture, install, or operate it completely independent of Huawei. How should we react to that? So that's an interesting idea. I remember, Steve, the last time we saw each other, um, you mentioned that as well. I haven't heard uh, much about that since, so I don't know how serious the proposal that was. Um, this, but administ this, is this administration apparently turned it down I, without really explaining why it was turned down, but it would kind of put us on that, put some American company, whoever it was, I don't know, you know it could be AT&T, it could be um, you know, a, a manufacturer, um, but put them in the 5G business. Yeah, so I don't know this, I, again, I don't know the specifics of, of that policy debate, um, but this is an area where, I mean, I think the 5G area is emblematic of the, the, the broader problem, uh, at least as it relates to the Trump administration's approach to some of these issues um, that we've seen elsewhere, which is number one, um, the problem, the issue itself has not been clearly described. Uh, and so there's, I think it, it has been unclear to people what is actually the issue here, what's actually the problem. Um, it hasn't been well communicated. It hasn't been well coordinated with our allies. Um, and most importantly, again, we haven't come up with an alternative. Um, so the, you know, the, the times that I've had the chance to talk to administration officials about this, my message is always, look, you can't go rolling into a foreign capital and say, you know, don't use Huawei. And that's the end of the conversation that if you don't right. have, we should do this instead, whether it's an international consortium or whether it's some kind of effort to move to um, an open architecture, which I know a lot of people are, are thinking about, um, then you can start to get somewhere. But simply um, trying to forbid countries from using Huawei is going to be a losing proposition. So presenting alternatives is, is fundamentally yeah. important as part of that package. Yeah. And it gets to the report's emphasis on doing everything multilaterally, you know, putting right. it together. I mean, it's, it's, it's a recurrent theme in the, in the report and it's one which is absolutely right. All right. Uh, David Harvelitz asks, how can free market economies compete with centrally planned ones where Huawei gets 75 billion plus monopoly protection. Cisco gets 44 million. That's any quotes of an article from the Wall Street Journal. Right, so this is a, um, 
I think, again, at the root of elements of the economic challenge and the technological challenge, which is that um, the United States, if it uh, maintains a, an entirely open system and China doesn't play by, the, by those rules, then, it, then we're going to be quite disadvantaged. And I think some of the notions of reciprocity and uh, trying to rebalance that economic relationship is what a number of people are thinking about now. Uh, in Washington. I don't think the answer is uh, that we want to be entirely like them. Um, you know, we have to uh, maintain, <laughs> uh, you know, the things that we believe about the way uh, competitiveness is important and whatnot. But, um, you know, in areas where we think that China is, is doing things that are unfair or illegal as it relates to the trading regime, I think, in the investment regime, I think using um, trade remedies to rebalance that so those companies aren't advantaged um, is important. Uh, and then thinking about, you know, there's, there's, I, again, I think this is uh, a very nascent topic in Washington, but I think, you know, how are we thinking about not Chinese style, but industrial policy in the United States in terms of um, technology and, and investments and otherwise. And um, the problem is again we don't have a we don't have a reliable process to do that right now with this administration. But um, that would be certainly something that um, we should be taking a look at. Whether it's you know the kind of investments we're making in artificial intelligence, in five G, and otherwise, that there's going to be a role for the U.S. government in this as there has been in the past. What do you think the you know thinking about industrial policy? You know the the two trillion the two trillion that that is being put to fight the economic effects of the coronavirus. How do you think that is gonna change the landscape in Washington thinking about funding these initiatives? Well, it's a good question. And, and um, you know, those, that sum is so vastly beyond um, what would be required. And so you take an area like, you know, Steve, we were just talking about um, the R&D profits that, that semiconductor manufacturing equipment companies are getting vis-a-vis uh, -vis their sales in China and, and, you know, making up that delta, you know, it'd be a rounding error on that, on that $2 trillion. So um, I think that's true. We're going to be, uh, you know, absorbing massive deficits as part of this. Um, I guess it could, it could cut a different way. I mean, either we come out on the back end and we're going to be thinking about fiscal austerity um, or, you know, adding on a few extra expenditures isn't going to feel so great in that context. Um, you know, maybe there's a way, again, I, uh, I, I guess I'm thinking out loud, maybe there is a way to, as we're, if there's going to be a second stimulus package or a, a third as we go through this, um, can we be thinking about some of these broader priorities um, in addition to feeding the immediate needs as we're sort of re-, re um, designing our economy. So um, I don't know. I think we'll have to, that'll, that'll be a way to be seen. But clearly, you know, the current economic crisis um, that's going to unfold here most likely is going to be absorbing the U.S. government for some, some time to come. Yeah. Which leads to an interesting question from Jonathan Marshall. Uh, thanks, Eli. Can you say a bit more about how a potential democratic administration might frame a China policy? What do you think its priorities will be? Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to answer that, not speaking on behalf of, of a particular um, candidate or, or whatnot. But, um, you know, I think there, if the question is really what would be different um, from what we're seeing out of the Trump administration, I think there would be a few areas of contrast in terms of the Democrats. I mean, I think one would be, um, on the on the values question, where I think the President Trump himself and the Trump administration has all has obviously been pretty weak in this area. This is, um, you know, I think a, a defining difference between the United States and China. So more focus on um, democracy and human rights um, in China, but also as it relates to the way we think about the broader competition between the United States and China, I think would be one. Uh, potential area. Um, another would be, you know, Democrats, probably other mainstream Republicans, but I think a Democratic administration would be 
much more focused on strengthening and, and building alliances rather than trashing them, which the Trump administration has done. So um, to my point of, you know, you need your allies to deal with a lot of these problems, um, the Trump administration has not been making great friends. And I think to the extent that there are areas where we need to cooperate, um, it's only made the more difficult by the Trump administration's overall orientation towards alliances. So I think um, the, the focus on allies would be quite different. Um, another area would be related to that, but not exactly the same would be, I think Democrats obviously are um, more open to multilateralism, um, which is important in the Asia context with um, ASEAN and, and a whole bunch of, you know, the alphabet soup of organizations out there, the ASEAN Regional Forum, APEC, the East Asia Summit, of course, the World Health Organization, um, the, Paris, the uh, Paris Climate Treaty, all these, all these different multilateral arrangements. I think Democrats tend to view these um, as benefits rather than burdens for the United States. So I think more of a more participation in those, more focus, more respect, more funding, um, UN agencies and otherwise would be um, another potential di difference. Um, and then finally are the, you know, the investments at home. I think this is an area, again, Steve, just to your last question that will be likely colored by the amount of uh, spending we're, we're doing in some of these um, current bills, but in areas, I saw the president was treating, tweeting about infrastructure today, but as it relates to um, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, basic research, education, healthcare, um, and then other domestic policy issues like um, immigration and, and visa policy. Uh, I think sort of investing in, in American competitiveness uh, in, through sort of progressive uh, domestic policy priorities would, would be another potential difference. So I think there's actually a lot of differences. You know, I will say um, also in relation to that question, um, you know, the, the, the Trump administration and I think maybe the president himself sees the China issue uh, as one of great advantage to them. Um, and, uh, you know, he's often talked about how he's, you know, tough on China and he's the only one who's tough on China. Um, you know, I think that uh, is an argument Democrats are willing to have. Um, I don't think the way that I describe the president's administration is, you know, he's confrontational without being competitive. Um, he's not competitive as it relates to values. He's not competitive as it relates to allies, um, et cetera, et cetera. His sort of fawning relationship with Xi Jinping. Um, so, you know, I don't think the, the president has a lot of uh, hot rhetoric on China, but I don't think he's got a lot to back him up in terms of enhancing American competitiveness in the way that, that, that we put forward in this report. So I think there's a, a long way to go. And again, I think that could be a, a bipartisan agenda. So it's not exclusive to the Democrats, but there's, there's a lot of room. Uh, there's a lot of areas where the Trump administration has just not put forward a competitive policy where the Democrats could do better, I think. Yeah, which is, gets into this question from Eric Heyer, who says, does the U.S. really have the willingness and resources to do what needs to be done, possibly on the scale of the post-World War II investment in Europe and Japan to build Pax Americana? I would also ask that, you know, the report, similar question, the report really comes out for a, 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 an America that participates in a new TPP. Is that something that's realistic in this in the trade environment in the United States today? Both questions. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a good question. I guess on the first one, um, you know, I think the jury's still out about how central is this issue going to be um, in in American politics and U.S. foreign policy. I think that's you know, and and, and the degree to which. It is a central focus is is a little um, to be determined. I mean, I think a lot of people on this call probably think it is or it should be, um, but when you poll Americans, uh, it's not always the case. And um, our political leaders are on Capitol Hill. I think starting to talk a lot more about this issue on both sides of the aisle, not just Republicans but um, Democrats as well. So that may be a leading indicator and and 
Americans uh, are getting more concerned in general about um, the China challenge, but um, I think we'll have to see sort of what the what the politics of this are and what kind of will um, the American people have. I think that's again, it'll be up to political leadership to um, set the priorities, and make that clear. Um, as it relates to resources, you know there are things that are going to cost money, but I think if you went through the nearly 100 recommendations in this report, um, the price tag is not going to be enormous. That this is a lot of this is about, um, again, sort of diplomatic leadership, um, normative leadership, and and smart policies and strategy, and working with allies and um, some investments at home, but not things that would um, break the bank. Um, and the you know the end state again is not to. I mean, I'm not sure Pax Americana is the right phrase because nowhere in the report are we referring to, you know, trying to reassert an, an age of American uh, hegemony or predominance, I think. And, you know, I think, and, and interestingly, I'm not sure this has gotten as much attention, but even the Trump administration's national defense strategy, which was, um, I think, a really important strategic document as far as these things go, um, and some of the authors who have written about that since they've left the administration say quite explicitly that um, the area of dominance, the era of dominance is over, that what we're trying to do here is, at least in the defense area, is reassert deterrence. That It's much more um, defensive and, and uh, it doesn't require, you know, rewinding the clock back to 1995 or anything. So... Um, the the ambitions are actually a little more modest, even than they were for the liberal internationalists in the 1990s who were trying to transform the whole world uh, in Asia um, to look like their image. So I think there's a little more realistic acceptance in this strategy, uh, and I don't think it's necessarily going to break the bank. Um, as it relates to um, TPP and trade, I think the... Um, you know, the jury is still out on that. The president who was... Um, very negative on NAFTA, made fairly modest changes, many of which were actually part of TPP, rebranded it, and now sold it as a big success. So could he get minor changes to what was TPP, um, and, and might he go in in a second term? I think it's possible. Um, and Democrats have said, um, you know, they're, they're not going to take the deal as is, but if um, we make the investments at home first and we deal with some of the dislocations of trade. Um, if labor and environment are at the table, um, better America be writing the rules uh, than China. So uh, I don't think it's completely off the table, but um, certainly it would uh, require, you know, a fairly um, substantial, again, political leadership as would a lot of these issues. But I think the, it's, it's not completely out of the question. Um, and separate from the specifics of TPP, I think any, you know, reasonable strategist would tell you that, that uh, the economics are at the center of a lot of this. And if the United States isn't leading on trade and investment and setting those rules, then it's going to be hard to advance our interests otherwise. And, and Steve, we were talking a little bit earlier about the defense piece of this. I mean, I think that is, it'll be important. Uh, for the United States to maintain conventional deterrence in Asia to prevent a conflict. But, um, you know, th that's not going to be at this, hopefully not at the centerpiece of this competition. Right. Um, the Henry Luce Foundation doesn't say who there. You mentioned that we don't need anti-China coalitions, but coalitions that in some cases may include China. Can you speak more to this point? What are some examples of those inclusive coalitions? I expect climate change would be, be one, but others? Um, so I think certainly, um, you know, to the extent that there are, um, if the question is what are the areas of, of potential cooperation with China and, and in the multilateral context, um, climate change absolutely is, is high on that list. Um, global public health is. I mean, I think that's actually in our in our report that we did cite as an area where uh, the United States could be working together with China, um, as is um, non-proliferation and arms control, um, both as it relates to nuclear weapons, um, you know, limiting uh, agreements, as well as 
uh, non-proliferation, North Korea, Iran. So again, those issues aren't going away. Um, and I think, you know, the prospects for cooperation there, again, if, um, if the relationship gets so confrontational, I could imagine our country is not being able to, to cooperate on some of those issues. But again, Steve, if we, if we did a number of these recommendations in this report, um, and the United States, even in the context where it was viewing China as a, um, a competitor in a number of arenas, I think there still would be enough uh, overlapping interest on some of these issues where both Washington and Beijing would be willing to sit down in advance where there's mutual interest. So again, I don't, I don't think that's um, totally off the table. Again, if we had uh, maybe a different kind of administration than, than the Trump administration. Yeah. Uh, from an anonymous- and frankly, let me, let me just say one more word yeah. about that, which I think it, it relates to one of your earlier questions, which is that, um, you know, it may also be that uh, the United States would be more effective at eliciting cooperation from Beijing in an environment where uh, the United States was confident and strong rather than um, in a position that Beijing perceived as a position of weakness or, or decline for the United States. So Absolutely. again, I find, a, I find a more competitive United States to be a more stable uh, bilateral relationship and, and regional environment. Would we get more cooperation from Beijing if we didn't characterize this competition as strategic? If we characterized it as economic and diplomatic, but not strategic? Strategic bring, connotes kind of existential that some point Chinese are gonna land in California and take over the place or subvert the United States or we're gonna land in China and, and uh, march to Beijing. Um, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it help us kind of get to some of the places we wanna go? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about the, um, the particular language um, and it'll be interesting to see how that evolves and how much of the conception of strategic competition does or does not outlast uh, the Trump administration. But I think, um, yeah, a more clear articulation of what is this about? What are our interests? What are we trying to do? What are we not trying to do? Um, I think would be particularly useful. Yeah, I would even make the argument that, you know, Chinese human rights violations, so the policy in, in Xinjiang, which is so abhorrent, if they would be more willing to listen to us if we hadn't characterized the relationship as a strategic competition, that even when we make good points, the Chinese perception is just, is just an attempt to undermine their rule within China. Yeah, I think that's right. So the rhetoric matters. And um, again, I think uh, it, that's been, I think, you know, the, the, the sort of fighting over what are we calling COVID-19, is it the China virus or the Wuhan virus? And um, having that, getting into that whole struggle with Beijing, much less with our, at the G7 and, and with our allies and partners, doesn't seem like the best area to, um, to put our energies. And I think, again, is exemplary of what I was talking about earlier about being confrontational without being competitive. If the United yeah. States wants to compete with China over, uh, COVID-19, how about having a, you know, very competent uh, response here at home, being generous and leading abroad? I mean, that's how you compete with China. You don't compete with China just by name calling. Yep. Um, this is from Jigar Khatri. Some scholars, such as Michael Beckley, argue that a faltering China would become more aggressive if China experiences a significant slowdown in the near future, what are the odds that an armed conflict between the United States and China would erupt and where are the most likely flashpoints? So that's a good question. Um, as it turns out, um, I'm actually running a project right now at CNAS that's looking at what would be some of the geopolitical implications of um, a, a stumbling China or whatever you wanna call it, a slowing China. Um, and interestingly, we've talked to a lot of people, um, took a careful look at the history. Um, you know, you can't predict the future, but history would suggest that in times when uh, Beijing has been 
more concerned about uh, domestic instability that they've actually sought to have a more cautious regional and international response that the concerns about rallying around the flag and, and uh, diversionary war and wag the dog and these kinds of things. Um, there's not a lot of people that think that's, that's a likely response from Beijing, that likely they would, you know, if provoked, of course they're going to respond, but that they're not um, likely to be looking for a fight. So that's not something I, I worry about too much, frankly. Yeah. Um, Monique Rodriguez over at uh, Qualcomm. What's your assessment of how China is reframing its role in COVID-19 and how it is positioning itself as a global leader post COVID-19? What should the U.S. be taking into consideration? So that's a great question, Steve. I'd love to hear uh, your, uh, I know you're just asking the questions today, but I'd love to hear um, your I've response you to that as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to take a first swing at it, but would be interested in, in your response. I mean, look, clearly um, there is a political element to the way Beijing is responding to this. Um, I think this gets to some of what I was saying earlier about China perceiving itself as um, in competition with the United States, the way it uh, tried to mask some of its own problems at home, um, and then uh, some of the propaganda and, and uh, disinformation that it's put out uh, since then. Um, and I was just reading today, for instance, the, uh, of a study that was looking at the social media traffic in Italy, uh, and that the, something like 33% of the pro-China comments on Italian Twitter were coming from Chinese bots. Uh, that were put forward by by who knows. Um, so, you know, that's clearly an element. The narrative and the messaging is an important part of this. Um, and how it all shakes out, I mean, it's a great question because on the one hand, um, you know, most people believe that the virus uh, originated in China, um, despite some of their efforts to throw confusion around that. So whether there's a reckoning around that down the road internationally, I think will be a question. Um, then again, their domestic response, parts of it were sort of, um, I think, unacceptably authoritarian, but uh, they did manage the crisis in a way that um, some others in the world uh, have not done so quickly. And who knows what happens when this thing hits other parts of the developing world. So, um, and then, of course, their international response um, that they have been trying to cast as leading and generous. Um, and yet we have this other problem of a number of these masks proving defective or some of the test kits proving defective. So um, I think there's a lot of pressure is pushing in different directions. But um, again, as it relates to the U.S. response, I think the how competent we are um, domestically and whether we're leading the world on finding vaccines and, and cooperating um, is gonna be really important. Um, I think probably in some ways, uh, the most important factor thinking about international leadership is gonna be um, how, the, how our economic, how our economies fare coming out of this. I mean, I think if we, if we all kind of muddle and stumble through and we end up sort of in the same places as we were before relatively, that's one question. Um, if the Chinese economy bounces back in more of a V-shaped fashion and and the United States is in a sustained recession, of course, that's a very different environment. So, um, you know, a little too early to tell here. I do think we're in, um, you know, the, this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint in terms of how this issue displays. And who knows, in the final analysis, um, the U.S. response, once we get our act together, might end up looking fairly competent. China may have a second round of infections. Who knows? So, a little too early to tell, but clearly, um, you know, this is an area of, of geopolitical competition, and it's not just the Trump administration making it that way. Yeah, but I think this is, I think, the, you know, the Chinese Communist Party studies what it does very in, in great depth. And they had in place a system for disease reporting, which screwed up where the local officials did not allow the reporting to go up. And by the time it went up, 
it was too late for them to get a hold of the, uh, you know, of the vials to get any level of control. The screw up was, is, is one of those times when you just go, oh my God, the system doesn't work. The party has recognized that. And the first line of defense has been changing the narrative in China that they did, they had this heroic effort that, you know, they acted once they learned that the, the disease could be, could have human to human transmission. So they, the first effort was to kind of make murky the origins and the failure of their own system that China CDC, George Gao, um, who, you know, I know met with a bunch of times, um, you know, who was trained in the United States was kind of misled on this stuff. And when he sent his people down, finally, they realized it and came back to Beijing and said, you know, the folks down in Hubei are totally misleading us for their own reasons. The, the Chinese official, a local official's sense to minimize what's going on just went amok. Now what they're doing globally is they fear, they're not, they're afraid of, the, they worry about US-China relations, they worry about their relationship with the rest of the world. And that yep. this can really redound to an uh, enormous blow to their prestige, to their ability to operate in the rest of the world. I mean, this, these early mistakes were tragic. Now we had early mistakes in the United States also, which were tragic. But at the inception, it was China's flawed approach, uh, which is, is this propaganda is really about trying to shape the narrative around their incredible mistakes. Now, the party will have an internal document which analyzes this and tries to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, I'm not sure what the results will be, but the analysis is already going on and the propaganda department has already made a decision as to what they should be doing. And I think, and I think the question of, you know, is, are the actions they're taking vis-a-vis -vis Italy or Spain or otherwise um, going to bend the curve on those those perceptions? And I think we don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah, and are they going to bend the curve on the on the, you know, the number of viruses? It's, it's right, right. Um, yep. Matt Sheehan asks, when it comes to the U.S. offering alternatives to Chinese technological infrastructure in the developing world, how can the U.S. government facilitate the creation of these alternatives or incentivize the private sector actors to be more active in these markets? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and one of the um, sort of specific uh, recommendations that was included in this report that is um, some of our, our Asia team actually led by uh, Dr. Dan Kleiman uh, has been working on for, for well over a year predating this report was uh, the concept of a, of a US digital development bank. Um, and the idea here was in part that um, as it relates to the Belt and Road Initiative, the answer is not for the United States to try to compete dollar for dollar, but that there may be certain areas where the United States does want to um, compete with China's efforts to, to um, design the sort of infrastructure and architecture in certain areas, and that the telecommunications area was an important one, um, and one in which uh, the United States has natural advantages as it relates to our own companies and, and human capital. Um, sorry, I should be coming back here. Um, and so, um, uh, our folks put together this notion of a of a digital development bank. It has gotten some traction. I think it's been there's been some uh, legislation drafted to this effect that would uh, focus for you know U.S. backed loans um, in the digital area uh, to support some of this infrastructure, given um, the importance of the of the digital domain as an area of of competition or at least difference in terms of how the United States envisions the future from China. Um, so I think that is an area to focus U.S. resources and attention. You know, in the report, you talk about increasing cooperation with the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. Um, why not with AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, as well? Why don't we increase cooperation with them? I think that would be worth taking a look at. Again, I, you know, it, that is um, not something I would necessarily 
uh, discount out of hand. I think it would be worth consideration. I think there'd be a question of whether you would get it funded, uh, whether you get the resourcing you needed for it out of the US Congress. So there might be an obstacle there, even if the administration wanted to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, might be worth including in a, in a broader development strategy. And, and development should be, you know, there was a question earlier about areas of potential cooperation between the United States and China. If, um, you know, in certain areas, that, that should be an area where uh, we could work together. Again, there are obstacles to that on a number of fronts, but um, if it's done in a certain way and, and through institutions and with other partners, then um, certainly there's, there's more demand than our two countries can handle. I'm not sure if I feel Matt Furchin, who's a public intellectual of the, of the committee, asked a question, um, which you, um, I don't fully understand. What is your assessment of where the blue capital B dot capital D network is headed? Included, including under either a potential second Trump administration or a possible Biden presidency. First, tell us what the blue dot network is. So the blue dot network uh, is an effort to um, establish essentially shared standards for um, development. I'm not sure whether it's just development finance or projects um, as almost a certification process. Um, and this is something that uh, I believe now is currently a cooperative effort between the United States, Japan, and Australia, but the desire would be um, to multilateralize it over time. So this is a fairly new initiative that the Trump administration has rolled out. Um, I don't know what its future is. I don't know how much traction it's been doing. I think it's, it's fairly new. Um, but the idea itself is good. I mean, I think establishing some kind of um, shared understanding of um, what constitutes best practices as it relates to environment and labor and financial standards, um, if adhered to and agreed upon, would alleviate a lot of the concerns about Chinese investment and Belt and Road. And as, as I, you know, AIB is an interesting example here where in many ways, um, one could argue in part because of US pressure, the AIB really has elevated to a level of international norms on, on a number of uh, lending issues. Um, I think this is an effort to try to uh, do that more broadly in, in development finance. So we'll see where it goes. I, don't, I guess I don't have a firm view of that particular effort, but I think the overall idea is the right one. Yeah, I would not agree with because of US pressure that happened. It happened because the chairman, that's how it was conceptualized and the chairman uh, who had worked at the World Bank and the ADB for many years brought on a team that was devoted to establishing an institution that meant, um, that met global standards, including um, a former general, general counsel of the World Bank out of the US Treasury, Natalie Lichtenstein, who spoke at the National Committee uh, a year or so ago. Um, question from, we got about uh, nine minutes left. Uh, Tim Stratford um, asks, you're up early, Tim, or you're in the United States, one or the other. A Chinese vice minister told me in March that the party had recently concluded that the goal now of the United States government is not only economic containment of China, but also undermining Chinese Communist Party rule. And that if this isn't the US government's policy, we needed to let Chinese leaders know quickly and clearly. How do you think the United States government should characterize its relationship with the, China, with the CCP? I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that, I, you know, I don't think it's accurate that uh, there's a consolidated policy decision in the United States to um, challenge the rule of the Communist Party. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, and again, you know, it, there are big disagreements about that. I'm not sure that's been... Uh, again, I think there, there are, there are, oh, there's a wide spectrum of views on that in the United States. Um, but for me personally, I guess my answer is uh, sort of where we began, which is that I think the United States should focus on its own competitiveness and a design a strategy to advance U.S. interests, assuming that Xi Jinping is going to be running the country, assuming the Communist Party is going to be running the country. Um, 
rather than having a strategy that that is trying to change China or change the priorities of the Communist Party, which I think is a much harder prospect. So, um, you know, I guess that's that's what I would say is I don't think we should worry too much um, or we shouldn't focus on trying to change them. I think we should really be focused on our own competitiveness. Yeah. Have the Chinese reacted to your study? And if so, what'd they say? You know, I haven't, I haven't heard a lot of uh, specific critiques, so I don't know. It, it, it got very positive reception on Capitol Hill, but um, others may have a better sense of that. Uh, someone by the Ming Xinhe asks, how do you view the future cooperation between scholars from the two countries? There are a lot of scholars from either side in both the United States and China, some professors in the U.S. related to China were arrested. So, what's the future of academic exchange? I think it's um, yes. You know, I mean, everyone who's in this business, I think, would admit it's gotten more difficult over the last decade. And I think it's, um, you know, you can see in the. Um, conversations you have and the writing you see of Chinese scholars who I think used to be able to speak more freely um, that you know often in particularly in the public eye they're they're more towing the party line than they were 10 years ago and that's sorry to see um, but I still think it's important I don't again I there are very few I think people who would argue that that less ac ac academic exchange is better um, and in fact, the um, the recommendation we make in the report vis-a-vis, -vis, um, not sure this is exactly the question, because it obviously depends on whether you're thinking about sort of social sciences versus hard sciences or otherwise, but the, um, the recommendation that we make is that the United States should be welcoming of Chinese students and scholars. I mean, we do have to think about, take a realistic approach to espionage risks, which are real, um, but that, um, you know, we should be doing everything we can to get uh, talented Chinese students and professors to the United States and to keep them here. And we ought to make it easy for smart Chinese graduate students not only to come to the United States, but to come and, and stay and build their businesses here and use their knowledge here. And again, that's what a competitive strategy looks like, uh, um, trying to get all the talent that we can into the United States, uh, including from China. So academic exchange is, is, is pretty important part of that. Uh, Chris, Merck, um, I, I'm, I, I, your question is about TPP. I think we've covered that, uh, Eli, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ethan Paul, on the topic of military balances, can the US reasonably expect to deter China, Russia, and Iran simultaneously? Um, Sure. I mean, a deterrent, sure. Is it, if that's a question around, you know, could the United States fight three wars at the same time, that would be a different question. But um, can the United States conventionally deter, deter Iran, Russia, and China reasonably? Yes. And I, we've been doing it to date. And um, I think with the right, with the right reforms, we can, we can do it in the future. Uh, from Bob Feline. Sometimes when I hear policies that are directed to the U.S. government, I feel we don't trust our own values and open society, transparency, and our private sector in rising up to the challenges of a state-designed regressive economic policy of the current Chinese administration. What's your assessment of U.S. business in China? So that's a... You know, that's a good question. Um, and clearly the, um, you know, by all, I mean, it's hard to generalize about the U.S. business community, but I think one of the things, one of the many things that has changed in the U.S.-China relationship over the last several years is that the business community was often viewed as, uh, you know, what people describe as the ballast of the relationship. Uh, and that um, whenever there were calls for, accepting more risk or more tension in the relationship that often the U.S. business community was the first one to uh, um, argue for a, a more stable relationship. I think 
Um, while not all businesses agree, certainly not with the specifics, but even with the thrust of what the Trump administration has tried to do with some of their trade rem remedies, I think there is a growing sense in the U.S. business community that, um, let's say, business as usual with China was no longer acceptable. Um, and so I think there has been some support, uh, at least for thinking about more reciprocity or how to deal more aggressively with um, some of those issues. Um, and then the need to, you know, in certain instances, this relates a little bit to the semiconductor manufacturing equipment conversation we had earlier, um, you know, a certain type of uh, profit seeking short termism in the US business community has not always led to decisions that are in the national interest of the United States. So, um, and there are, there are instances in which um, it is incumbent upon the United States to prevent the transfer of certain technologies, particularly when they're supporting human rights violations or um, dual use items that are gonna lead to a security challenge with the United States. So I think there is um, a role for the United States in, in setting the bounds of economic um, engagement with China um, and then letting Americans, uh, American businesses compete therein. Yeah. The, um, by the way, speaking of the economic side, I see that you, you, some, you, you opine or the report opines that we should think about delisting Chinese companies that don't meet audit requirements. Don't we have to do that? But you don't add a, a proviso that that has to be done in conjunction with the UK and Hong Kong and other places where they simply would go and list. So is that just, is that not what you believe or is just missing from the report? Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to get back to you on that detail. Yeah, because it would be peculiar if, if we said you can't list here, but then they get on a plane, they go to London, so we just lose the business in the United States. I'd realize- right. So your question is there, is that, sh should that be a multilateral yes. approach? Uh, that's a good question. It would have been worth considering that. I don't think we, we took a look at that. We were thinking just domestically. Only because I'm sitting four blocks from the New York Stock Exchange, I would hate for them to lose the business and see it go to the LSE or the HKSE. Right. Um, right. My staff is reminding me I, I imposed on your time an extra 15 minutes. I thought we had 90 minutes. We only had 75. But anything, I'm not going to get to all the questions. I still have many more. Um, anything you want to say to close? But it's been a terrific interchange. Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, I apologize for the uh, te technological difficulties, but I'm glad we found a way here. Um, I don't know what was what was happening earlier. So, um, you know, I think that I, I guess I'll say a version of what I was trying to say when um, my computer started crashing in the first place, which was um, whether we agree or not about the big questions, let's find the areas where we do agree. And if that's, you know, thinking about investing in ourselves and our education and, and uh, research and development um, as we think about cooperating with allies and engaging regional institutions and those issues, um, why don't we start now with that agenda, which isn't in and of itself going to be easy. It's going to take some time to rebuild our, renew our competitiveness in all these areas. Um, rather than believing, rather than getting in our trenches about what we think about the future of China and the future of the U.S. relationship and feeling like we don't want to come out of our foxhole until we've either won those battles or fully adjudicated them or there's some new um, Mr. X article in foreign affairs that just clears it all up for us and we know exactly what our China strategy is going to be going forward. Um, you know, my, I actually want to do this as an exercise, Steve, maybe it's something your organization could help with. Why don't we get a bunch of people from, with really different perspectives on the China challenge in a room together and find out what we agree on and then try to move forward with those priorities. Um, sure. Because I think, again, regardless of, you know, if you, if you bracket out the people who just want to fold up America's role in the world and go home and you bracket out the people that, uh, you know, want World War III with China tomorrow, and you have everyone in the middle, uh, I think there's a lot we can agree on. So why don't we get together, find out where the, you know, let's draw a Venn diagram, see what's in the middle, and, and, and speak publicly about the importance of that set 
that's again, that's what I was saying earlier. That's the new China consensus, right? Yeah. Why don't we get after that set of policies? It's going to be much more focused on us, and we can still argue and disagree about the other issues, and we should. Um, but there's a lot we agree on, and uh, that should be our the, the areas we agree on should be the priority uh, for the next several years because it's going to take a while to work our way through them. Uh, yeah. no matter what. I think that's a, it's a great note to end on. As I started with, the overwhelming majority of recommendations in the report I agree with. You know, increasing federal R and D. Of course, we have to. I mean, you know, there's so many things as I read through it where I would just go, of course, of course, of course. And if it takes China to kind of get us to reinvest in ourselves, I'm actually okay with that too. That's fine. But Eli, thank you so much. Thank you all. I see the overwhelming majority of you stayed with us the whole time. But uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today. We will reconvene um, in a couple of weeks. Eli, thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thank you, everyone.